So introduce here, Dr. Robin Evans Agnew is an associate professor at the University of Washington Tacoma School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. He focuses on critical theory and participatory approaches for health promotion and activism, including the application of photo voice for advancing environmental justice. We thank you, Robin, for agreeing to moderate this panel, suggesting people to invite, and developing inspiring questions for the conversation today. I also want to extend a special shout out to uh, Bob Strack, one of today's panelists, for helping to organize and plan this panel and recruiting Robin as moderator. Robin and Bob were co-editors of the Photo Voice special topic issue of Health Promotion and Practice published in March of this year. Their ongoing collegial relationship contributed a lot to this panel, so thank you, Bob, also. And finally, I extend a huge thank you to the esteemed photo voice practitioners and scholars who agreed to be on this amazing panel today in alphabetical order, Marianne Burris, Jen Fricas, John Olith, Elsa Oliveira, Bob Strack, and Michelle Tetti. We are so happy you agreed to be here with us and we look forward to your conversation. Without further ado, welcome Robin. I pass the baton for this esteemed panel to you. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Laura, and it's great to be here. It's great to see people. Uh, folks who are just joining us right now, we are an international panel today. Um, uh, so uh, we are still, uh, some, some of our panelists um, are just dialing in. Um, so it's, it's live action in front of you for the next uh, hour and a half. I'm super excited to be here. I'm actually calling in from, um, uh, the, uh, from the uh, uh, land of the Puyallup tribe of Indians on the west coast of America uh, in a small gritty little city called Tacoma. Um, I was walking down to, to, to come into my office and I was just seeing another, another burning happening on our tide flats uh, that I just wanted to whip out my camera and get a photograph of just so that I could document uh, the continued uh, uh, environmental injustices that are happening inside, uh, right outside my window here at, 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 on this on this uh, ancestral lands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians, and uh, they are still prevailing here and and um, living on. And my job is to try and care for the land as much as possible uh, for the future. Um, excited to see our panelists. We're going to go around and do a brief round of introductions. Just. Uh, let us know where you're calling in from, um, and uh, and then we'll kind of uh, jump into some questions. Super excited to have uh, folks around here now. Um, Marianne, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from right now? Super excited to see you. You have to click on the uh, unmute. So I'm Marianne Burris. Um, I'm calling in from uh, an Airbnb in London. I live in Nairobi, Kenya, which is Maasai land. Um, and I do a lot of work with indigenous people in everywhere I go. And uh, so I'm really struck by how you honor that. Thank you. What to say? Um, That's I, I, lovely. I'm, I'm, I'm in, in Kenya, we say mama something. I'm mama photo voice. I'm one of the mama photo voices. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, and we're going to get back to you. We want to get back to you to hear, hear a little bit more about the history. Yeah. Folks, you don't understand. We've been trying to find Mary Ann Burris for about a year and a half. Uh, and so we're super excited that she's here in this conversation. Today. I've been buzzing about this. So uh, Mary Ann, uh, we're going to get back to you. But um, one of my uh, co uh, comrades in terms of the planning committee for our photo voice uh, Ish, special issue in, in the health promotion practice journal was Michelle Tetti. Uh, Michelle is just getting up to make a cup of coffee or turn the window on, but do you want to just introduce yourself, Michelle? Yes, hi. I am Michelle Tetti, and I am a professor at the University of Missouri in public health and have been using uh, photo voice largely um, in the field of HIV um, for 10, 15 years now. So happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you, Michelle, for being here. Um, John, you're uh, my neighbor to the north. You want to just introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, greetings from uh, Vancouver, sunny Vancouver, um, Musqueam people's uh, land and really proud to be here. Um, yeah, I've been doing some photo voice work in, in, the, in gender, I think, and probably yeah, men's health more specifically around suicidality, depression. And our current work is uh, 
looking at how guys build equitable and sustainable intimate partner relationships. Awesome. Um, this is this is this is we are we are in the middle of a trifecta here because folks, if you go onto Web of Science and you tap in Photo Voice, the two most published authors in Photo Voice are right here in the room right now, John Olive and Michelle Tetty. So super excited to have them. And everybody references Marianne Burris. So one of the other people I wanted to introduce is someone new to the Photo Voice world, another neighbor of mine. Jen, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Of course, and thank you for inviting me, Robin. It's such an honor to be on the panel with all of you. My name is Jen Freakis. I come to you from um, the land known as Seattle, which is the unceded ancestral territory of the Duwamish, who are our Coast Salish peoples. And I'm an assistant professor at the College of Nursing at Seattle University. Splendid. Thanks, Jen. And um, uh, uh, Jen's like, uh, does sneak photo boy stuff she's she would she didn't tell me i had to find out she's on sabbatical but there's a there's, there's photo voice going on all the way over seattle university right now um a, a big a big exhibition that she had going on so uh, really fun to have you jen join us today um without further ado i'm wondering marianne can you take us back you you you, you in your in your bio you talk about getting your phd in international development at stanford and then moving to Beijing, 1990 to 1995, how did all of this come to play in working with the Yunnan uh, Women's um, Development uh, Board? How did, how did all of that kind of come into play? So I was finishing my PhD at Stanford and I got a phone call from the Ford Foundation, which frankly, I'd never paid much attention to. And they said, uh, your name keeps coming up. We wanna hire somebody to go to China to start our women's rights and reproductive health programs. And um, I thought, well, later. And it took a long time and they, anyway, finally I, they flew me to New York. I met them. I, I really liked it. It was a bunch of activists. I was surprised by that actually in suits, but still. And, um, so they hired me to take this job on and I arrived in China and they had already, the Ford Foundation had already decided that the program that I was supposed to start would be in Yunnan and I'd never worked in Yunnan. And it's a very atypical place in terms of China, right? It's, it's largely non-Han, the one child policy was quite different, you know, and, and I, I struggled against that a little bit and lost. And so I realized even more than I would have otherwise that if I was going to do good work there, I had to figure out how to make sure I wasn't the one calling all the shots, you know. Mm -hmm. So I started working with a woman from UCLA, Virginia Lee, who actually is Caroline Wong's mom. And, to, and together we rocked down to Yunnan and, you know, the... <laughs> The power differentials were, you know, there I was with millions of dollars to give away and everyone thought I worked for the CIA. So I had to be very, which I didn't, but you know, the Chinese were very particular, they were very suspicious as they should be, you know, this American foundation that all of a sudden cared about rural women. And so we kept trying to figure out a way of making sure that, that we, um, put in, pro in, in place a, a, a process where the learning was continuous and the documentation of it was done by the people who were supposed to be benefiting. And we came up with the idea of giving cameras to rural women um, in Yunnan. And these were villages where they had never had cameras, actually, most of them, and the women were not literate. And, you know, if I learned anything from all my years in the development, you know, in the foundation world and then running a small nonprofit, it's that the means are the ends. I mean, the way you go is where you get. I believe that about just about everything, but certainly about this kind of work. So we started slowly and gave cameras to these rural women and learned step by step. We you know, they, they um, at first we were just having them take pictures and collecting them and having conversations because it was about, you know, we knew, I knew enough to know that I was supposed to be doing reproductive health and rights, but you know, you don't, we wanted to find a method of engagement and participation that itself had power to it, that itself created, was active listening and created safe spaces 
and um, didn't segment life, you know. Um, so as a result of the research findings that came from this, we did biogas and pig food and cleaning up water. And, you know, this was all part of a reproductive health program because of course, when the women took pictures of their work lives and their health lives, these things showed up. And what was so different about it was that, you know, I had the money behind me because the whole initial reason was how do we spend the foundation's money well in Yunnan, you know? And because it was Ford and we could then as time went on and, and, and the photographs got better and we realized that we needed to pair the women with younger women who were literate so they could talk to them and write down the captions of the pictures. What were they taking photos of? Why? And, you know, months and months went on and the photos got better and better. And, um, and, and one thing that I, this was true in Kenya as well, which came later, they weren't just taking pictures of, you know, problems and horrible things. It was the things that worked in their lives and the beauty in their lives and how their families functioned and what gave them joy, what made them happy. And, and so after we had a body of work, we could convene a gathering in Kunming at the provincial capital that brought poverty alleviation, education, family planning, health officials into the room with these rural women and their photographs and let the, those officials w listen to the stories that these women wanted to tell them. I'll never forget one and then I'll be quiet. <laughs> there was a photo that a woman kept taking of girls with little boys on their back. Remember it's Yunnan so they could have two children. So if they had a daughter, the daughter stayed home from school to take care of the son because there was this, you know, the sons mattered and the daughters did it in terms of getting education. And they kept taking pictures like this to show that the girls weren't going to school. And so they showed all these pictures and the education minister got very flustered and he said, no, 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 in your villages, 98% of the girls in school are in school. And, and the woman said, oh, maybe you don't know how that happens. We're told when you're coming. So we send the girls to school on the day you come to count so we can make the quota. And she was, she was, it was that kind of spirit. And so instead of there being a fight, you know, all of these <laughs> real situations got revealed. Um, and it was, and it, that was the way the program, you know, from the, the beginning of that all the way through, we found ways of making sure that there was ongoing documentation that was really feedback it was really active listening so we 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 had a good idea and started with it but we fumbled and fell and then figured it out and um and that program really did shape the funding of all the Ford foundation programs in Yunnan eventually really yeah. wasn't wasn't aware of that very interesting um so you come back from that or Caroline comes back from that. You write three papers together um, it, explaining this. Um, uh, uh, I think Virginia Lee's inside uh, so, mm -hmm. some, some of that work. And Caroline talked about that a little bit with Bob and I when we were pulling together the paper. How does how does the um, how does the idea how does how does the idea kind of morph from photo novella to this photo voice from your perspective when you were thinking around it becoming more of a sort of a concept something that was a little different than had been done before. How, how, did, how did that kind of land with you? Because you took this on and then went out to Kenya, right? Yes. Um, well, I mean, it was learned by doing. And, and when we saw the power of the image, you know, this, the, the, the bravery that, that, you know, one of those women became a mayor. You know, that, you know, and, you know, and she was completely intimidated in the beginning of, of even speaking. So when I watched that over four years in China, the way in which just creating a safe space and that technology made a big difference and, and the images, you know, they came up against Chinese Communist Party sons. They kept taking pictures of lakes that had been fouled because an illegal tannery was there and and then they go, look, look, all animals are dying from this. And you couldn't argue with it. So um, 
you know, the, the way in which the, they linked their one, their problems and the aspects of their life. And then the power that came about from women, they loved their meetings. You couldn't get them to go home. You know, there was nothing like that. Um, yeah. All kinds of things came from it. So I left China, I moved to Kenya. I was responsible for the Ford Foundation's gender youth health programs in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe, which I knew even less about than I knew about Yunnan. And, you know, I'm from Texas, so I'm very comfortable with my ignorance. I will admit it. You know, so I knew I absolutely needed to find ways of, in the same way, of figuring out how to work with, the, in this case, with these young people in the peri-urban uh, settlements that we do call them slums in Kenya. That's what they call their homes. Um, and Lana Wong had heard about Photo Voice and she was living in Kenya. And we got together and started talking and we said, what are we doing with young people? And that's how it started. But it was so different in the end because there wasn't a there there in terms of Kenyan policymakers. We couldn't get the mayors and the governors and the local district officers to look at these photos. It was very, you know, they were just, you know, they didn't care about another picture of a child who'd been killed for stealing a radio or the trash heap that the children were playing on or the puppies or the sister dressed up for church. So we realized after you know trying to get them interested that really the value of that shootback program was what it was offering to the young people and it transformed their lives from that group we ended up with professional photojournalists working in europe you know all it changed their lives we got to do a big exhibition at the barbican in london and we had the money to blow up their photos and bring uh, six of the kids. Um, so even though we couldn't get the, we could get the Ford Foundation to pay attention to what they were taking pictures of. In China though, we could get the line ministries to pay attention. It's very, just Kenya, very, very interesting to see those two different tracks that uh, you've being able to kind of expand on it and employ the uh, employ photo voice and it's great to be here at this conference where I, I've, I've see I see both of those kinds of discussions kind of going on oh. wanted to welcome to our group Bob Strack Bob it's great to see you you've made it in from the mountains of of of, of uh, North Carolina you've got your hat on that's lovely Bob is my co-conspirator do you want to just introduce yourself and if you have some questions for, for Marianne as well I know we've been dying to talk to her for a while you'll have to unmute I'm unmuted, I think. Um, I got my festival hat on. I got to Lake as a hitchhiker and he gave me bad directions. And so I got to my setup spot later than I thought. But uh, it's good to be here. And I'm so glad that all the people on this panel are here too. And I, the, the questions you're asking, Marianne, are great. My job, one of my jobs, Marianne, I don't know if they introduced the fact that it was just your birthday a couple of days ago. And I, I'm failing on my job of having a cupcake and a candle. Oh. <laughs> Happy so, Mary, you have to imagine have a candle and we're all going to blow it out in celebration of your birthday and thanking Thank you for you. coming on this call with us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for, just before we sort of uh, dive into my questions for, for everybody here, any any other sort of burning questions you have for Mary Ann? Um, now, now we've got her on our panel. Well, you know, some of the things that you talked about have struck me and I I was just telling a, a friend around the campfire last night about this conference and this discussion. And one of the things that we never take the time to celebrate or even examine, I think, are those tentacles of an effort that then results in something beyond the moment you're in that effort, right? So it's pretty clear that the work that you did in the Yunnan province with Carolyn um, has had a lot of roots and a lot of legs, um, you, both rooted in how people are operating and the observations that you had. But then the power of recognizing that the voice matters and it's just been replicated so, so nicely. And I often wonder how much the Ford Foundation appreciates or celebrates the impact that that initial funding had for the field. Um, and I also think the same thing with local efforts. You know, we often empower people in communities to be a champion of local causes, but that 
that sense of self, that belief in being a change agent doesn't stop with the end of a photo voice project. So I'm just curious if you can reflect a little bit on what you see as the legacy of photo voice coming out of all the work you just described. I think it's, you know, we weren't the first. I mean, we were inspired by portraits and dreams and Wendy Ewald and people who were not necessarily doing photo voice, but the power of photography. And, you know, the, the and I do think, I mean, what a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years is is body mapping. I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, Life-size self-portraits where you also have an art therapy or a, you know, a, a workshop where people reflect, share, and then show their paintings. We do lots of uh, urban mural work that came from that. So I think the people on the ground doing the work we, you know, we learn and do the next step and do the next step and do the next step. And, I, you know, just being able to join today and just see some of the work that I've been able to see, you know, I have a million questions for everybody. There's so much good thinking behind it. And it's a different take when it's as research in the sense of publishing papers. And, you know, for me, it was, what do we do with this money and how do we make sure the program is good? And in, and in Kenya, I never took the time to write the papers. Now you've made me think I should. Um, I mean that because people find me. People do find me from <laughs> living in Nairobi. You know, they still find me with photo voice and some of the work I did at Ford in China because I did write some academic articles and I didn't when I, after I moved to Kenya in, in 1996. As for the foundation, foundation, the foundation world still likes to be everything should, new you know so the fact that we did a a second photo you know it, it's called shoot back it needed to have a different name it needed to sound new to be sexy and sellable even inside the i mean i was i was inside but to say oh we're going to do that again and it was so good unless no 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 we're going to do something new here and i don't that that's not wise. It's it's not how indigenous people learn, you know, everything else. Ah, I began this absolutely from whole cloth, but I do think that it's a it's a problem in the development world and in the foundation world because they that nobody wants to if anybody's ever tried to raise money for something you've done before, nobody wants to fund it. You gotta have a new name, you gotta pretend that nobody's ever done anything like this before because instead of saying, look. Look at all I'm standing on here. Yeah. That makes it more powerful. Profound words. I see a lot of our panelists are nodding their heads to that. Bob, did you have any follow up to your question? Yeah, I just want to follow up because I think the, the comment about new, I saw the comment from uh, Elena, and I think you're right. I'm, the newness is part of it. But I, I think about the Ford Foundation in particular right now. Um, under their current leadership, they do have a very heavy social justice mindset about how they're approaching the question. And so the new could be just the, the, the way we're using these methods. And I know one element of the discussion we'd love to have with everybody is thinking about, and I know you're going to go there, Robin, but like this whole critical consciousness piece. And I, you know, it, earlier you had commented that the leaders couldn't argue with what the women were showing. Um, like the evidence of the photo itself was irrefutable, but I think we're in a moment now where that's actually challenged, where evidence and data and what you actually see is now filtered through people's perspectives of what they want to be true and what they want to ally and support around. So, you know, Robin and I have had a lot of conversations about the elements of what makes photo voice work, and I'm a big believer in the caption and the story that goes with the photo. The photo itself is only one piece of the vehicle, but it's the it's the caption and the story and the face behind that image, meaning the person who's telling that story, which is that face, is the what really makes the method have its power. And we can't forget that. It's gotta be a both and, especially in a moment when sometimes truth, blatant and objective is not always believed or bought into. Yeah. So let's let's bounce off of Bob's prompt there and maybe go around the, the panel now to kind of hear from that. And if more questions are up for Marianne with this um, with this provocation to think about, you know, what is 
what's up with critical consciousness now? What, how important is the idea of conscientes ACL to you kind of as a photo voice practitioner in this present political moment, both personally and politically? Um, uh, John, you were doing the big nod head early, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you, John, first. Perhaps you can, you've been thinking about this, certainly in your work, trying to uh, elevate um, issues around men's health uh, to, to a sort of like a, a more, a, a wider sphere and, and, and your work with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm like a kid in a lolly shop at the moment because I could just listen to you guys chat and I'd be quite happy, you know, <laughs> just sampling on everything you've got to say. Um, uh, I, you know, I, th I, think it about, I think about it a lot as well. Um, yeah, we've always tried to do a relational piece around men's health. So we've always thought that if we could make a difference in men's health, we'd make a difference to everybody's lives. And Photo Voice has had a beautiful way of illustrating that in ways that, you know, I could articulate, but it's been captured in photographs and even captions. And it's just, it's so powerful. So I, I, think, it, I think it's kind of been super interesting to think something and someone else articulate it so eloquently and these are participants right um and i will share a, a photograph with you later you know that, that i think is one of my favorites right but um and the work we're doing at the moment i just just you know it's it's interesting because we've we're interviewing guys from 19 to 44 years of age and their relationship to photographs <laughs> is quite different because they're right clicking and sending us pictures from the internet and that's their, some of these guys it's their ideas of fun so the methods are kind of changing mm -hmm. as well within so you know uh the legacy and the fire you started uh mary is um it's like yeah it's like it's it's taking off in all sorts of directions and we just to say we interviewed guys from all over the world for this current study and mm -hmm. Photo voice just takes all the structure out of it. So I end up having conversations with these guys about all sorts of things, including Taylor Swift. <laughs> you know, things have got nothing much, I don't think, to do with, you know, what we're really asking. But they just own the photographs and they own the interview. And it's been so neat on Zoom. It's just another layering of it. Anyway, I, I've just rambled on about probably nothing much, but just thanks for the opportunity anyway. Well, I think that's, it's an interesting point to think about, you know, uh, Photo Voice taking the structure out of it, right? In, in terms of it, it maybe it, it balances power or it gives the power all to the person who's sharing the photo that they own, that they took, right? Their, their image, their place. How does that ring with you, Jen? What's, what's the critical consciousness What's going on with that for you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Robin. Um, these are all just such great points. And I echo John's idea that this is just such a great conversation. Um, I, I kind of, for this first question, went to kind of a, a big picture view, perhaps. So we're alternating between maybe the granular and the bigger picture. I think it's important to model the critical reflexivity by beginning with positionality. So I always like to start by saying to people, you know, I identify as a white Latina and a chronically ill disabled person. And those intersectional identities, you know, inform my work. Um, the relatedness to co-researchers, which people have been mentioning all throughout this conference, teaching, decision making about what projects to take on, those sorts of things. And I went back to Prairie himself, you know, in preparation for this panel to remind myself kind of of what he said about his concept of coming to critical consciousness. And sort of this critical awareness, right, of one's social reality through reflection plus action, which is exactly what photo voice does. So it gives you this ability to look at sort of social myths we have acquired from dominant groups and ways of thought, which I think is an interesting thing to re-examine in light of Bob's comments as well, like in this sort of post-truth era. Um, and I think one's social reality and Sort of critical consciousness necessarily forms right our way of thinking of understanding and so this is why i've been making this argument of late that all of our photo voice studies really should begin at the the level of epistemology um sort of it doesn't have to be something that's inaccessible you know like we've been talking about photo voice is designed to reveal the thinking of the co-researchers and then they're thinking about that thinking um 
And what we need to be aware of as academic researchers, I think, is that different ontological and epistemological groundings of that thinking between maybe our way of framing questions and issues and the ways in which our co-researchers might do that. Um, and I think that's all part of the boundary pushing. And it sounds kind of academic, but um, in my experiences trying to get to the heart of you know, indigenous-based and community-based well-being in Ecuador, you know, that started from a very different point of view. That starts from the notion of Cosmovision Andina, like a different worldview. Um, and if the researcher, the academic researcher doesn't take time to um, understand that properly, then the, the tenor or sort of the tone, right, of the entire project will, um, will not be honoring, right, that, um, that sort of source of critical consciousness of our co-researchers. So I kind of think about it, um, you know, at that at that broader level in terms of uh, making photo voice a little more anti-colonial. Um, so yeah, I'll just stop there for now. But those are some of my initial thoughts. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating because it sort of deals with it's you're you're still like you know struggling with power, but that but that mm -hmm. but your comment about critical consciousness doesn't just sort of happen from from this office right from my head right I've got to get into the context and the relationships and the people uh, that I'm working with to really kind of better position myself and sort of like uh, you know in, in in the sort of humility of of not knowing to be to get to knowing um or, or as or as John was saying they take over the conversation and they're and they're and they are and they are changing the paradigm as they begin to talk to you, Michelle. How does it work for you with critical consciousness and 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 this the importance of critical consciousness? This political moment, working with the people that you work with. Yeah, I uh, I really like the question. I was kind of surprised at how much it matches some of what I've been thinking about lately. So I think for me. I've been thinking a lot about what critical consciousness, what action-oriented research kind of means in, in constrained environments. So we've already sort of talked around this, but for me, like the US is somewhat of a constrained environment. The state I'm in Missouri is a very constrained environment and the university I'm at is a very constrained environment. So I'm thinking about issues like reproductive health and um, you know critical race theory and the anti-science movement. So. Like, what does it mean to have these methods in these really constrained spaces? Like, it just seems to be really important to create the spaces where it's possible, but it does feel like it looks different than some of my work in the past. So when Marianne was talking, you know, it was really reminding me of, you know, like the first photo voice project I ever did, it was with women with HIV and they just sort of took it and ran with it in these really textbook ways, right? So. Uh, you know, they were fighting for food insecurity and getting people refrigerators. And I mean, the, the kind of power of the images and the advocacy and the action just blew me away. But right now, I'm in a space where just identifying the issues is this action, right? So, um, you know, that, that, that's just what I've been been thinking about. And I'm, I'm working on a I'm working on a lot of projects right now, but one of them that I've been thinking about, I'm working on one related to IDE, so you know, inclusion, diversity, um, and equity initiatives at our university, and like what they're supposed to look like, what they actually look like, what they do, where there's gaps, and you know, the really important stakeholders at the very top, they're really afraid to even have discussions with us, right? So it kind of just hit me right away that I wasn't going to be able to reach those stakeholders and and is that okay right so there's a photo voice aspect of this project and it's sort of helping me identify what other stakeholders can we reach like what can we do with who we have that's ready to go now because there's a lot of things that aren't realistic in the environment I'm in right now and um yeah so so that that's I don't know if it answers the question but that's how I've been thinking about it how to still make it rele relevant and possible and be open to different ways that action-oriented work and critical conscious raising look like when we are super constrained. How to, how to lead the revolution within, how to, how to, how to. Yeah, with who's ready to go, right? You know, um, cause like I said, it's like when you're in the, yeah, yeah. You know, like around reproductive health, we're the first state to just ban all abortion, right? So like, well, what do you do in that space? Yeah. Right. It's so interesting because because we we were talking um, 
we were talking offline with Marianne before we got on. Um, and uh, in terms of, well, maybe this is part of the conversation, but in terms of uh, what's prohibited in terms of being able to take photos of right now in Kenya, you can't take photographs of certain events, right? You can't, um, uh, some, things, some things are illegal, right? In, inside the realm of photography and, and broadcasting. Is that you right? You can't Mary? post them. You can't I'm post listening. them. Mm -hmm. They will nail you. Yeah, I mean, because um, the police, the police in Kenya are truly terrifying. And lots of people were taking pictures in 2008 of post-election violence and continue to do so when they come in. Can I ask you a big question? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying uh, to mute you. Oh, can I ask you one question? Not Hold on a second. We, we, we'll, we'll take a, if, if you want to, if you have a question, we're following in the chat. So um, uh, throw out a question in the chat, dear audience members, and then we'll, we'll try and respond to that uh, that way. But yes, so Marianne said so that's what you were saying. So uh, the post-election violence, people are still taking photographs of that, but it's the actual sharing of those photographs. The the lands sharing. People it's the sharing um, and, and, that they would get you for. And I mean, if they see you with your phone, um, you'll get grabbed and, and beaten. But um, during really violent times in, 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 in Nairobi anyway, people know that they have to be very careful with the photos that they take. Right. Um, particularly if you've um, recorded a murder. Right. Yeah, so, so that's a, a whole different level. Um, and I don't wanna compare my context to that, but there are similarities in yeah. just you know this method that exists for people to advocate when there's so much suppression and fear around that, like what do we do with it, yeah. yeah. This is this is interesting space to walk into, Bob. Um, I'm I'm leaning over to you because I know you wrote the paper. Uh, you you worked with others to write the paper around um, uh, some of the issues with defamation and obscenity within within photo voice and this sort of work around how do you build that critical consciousness? How do you work and engage with people with new areas of knowledge, but also uh, this notion of risk and this notion of uh, danger uh, within within the photos that people are taking. Well, I think just the very fact that uh, a society on our earth is monitoring the sharing of information demonstrates the power within the method, right? So there's, there's, it's a, it's a power struggle for truth and art. I was, as uh, Michelle was talking in and, and Jen were talking, I was thinking, listening to what you were saying and it occurred, I know we want to talk about critical consciousness and earlier I talked about how, you know, photography and imagery has not objective anymore. Um, but I get thinking about audience and I get thinking about who is it we're trying to influence. And so often people are using photo voice to influence the photographers themselves, right? So that's the beginning. But then it bridges out from there and you begin thinking around and I've thought around, around like who are you trying to influence? You're certainly trying to influence your own community so that people are speaking from the same hymn book or have the same recognition of what not media you address, but it's the media, it's the decision makers, et cetera. And when, and when you think about critical consciousness, it's, it's really, I think, Jen, you said something and made me think about the critical consciousness of truth, right, which is fungible in, in our world right now. And then the critical consciousness of heart and thinking about how do we get people to a point where their consciousness is raised for empathy. Years ago, I saw Sierra Cooper was probably one of my first public health conferences out in San Diego when he gave a talk. And those of you who don't know, he wrote the AIDS report in the early 80s, um, was sort of a conservative darling, but then did things that the conservatives didn't like in the early 80s. And he wrote this report on AIDS and he gave his talk. And he talked about the three things as, as he saw them that were the biggest threats to public health. And it was racism, it was greed, and it was the empathy gap. And for me to see a conservative champion of the early 80s hit those three elements as the key biggest threats to, to public health, I, I saw it as very powerful and it's stuck with me ever since. And when I think about critical consciousness, I think it's not only truth, but I think it's heart. And how do we get to that point? Um, where I thought you were going, and I, the, we, I, you mentioned the, the decision tree article that's in our special issue, that's really geared towards America. So it wouldn't apply to probably the experience in Kenya necessarily. Although I think the legalities are geared towards the states. Obviously, the ethics and legalities are probably there's probably a lot of overlap, but we really did write it to uh, the sort of the lay of the land in the states relative to 
privacy and the law and photography and so forth. But where I thought you were going was, you know, we we spent some time in some earlier photo voice projects thinking around how do we create power within photo voice. And so often within photo voice, we're trying to move a community, right? And we've applied for funding with the federal government and with the big work foundations. And a lot of times they want power, but if you're but if your community is a community, you don't have power. And we we were moved by an article by Elizabeth Carlson in 2006. It was Photo Voice as Social Process for Critical Consciousness. And in that article, she takes the Freirian concepts and she breaks them down slightly differently in a way that was, um, I thought, more operational. And we've been using that in our efforts prior to this development of this instrument, but in our applying for federal grants to do this work, we never had the power issue. So we knew we needed a measure at the individual level so that we could get bigger and a bigger number, bigger sample size so that it would satisfy the bean counters. This is sort of the game you play, Marianne, when you're talking about taking something like photo voice and turning it into research. So we, we developed this nine item scale that walks uh, the people who might experience a photo voice exhibit through what they might experience in terms of critical consciousness. And to paraphrase how Elizabeth talked about that, she believed that people move from a state of passive adaptation to a state of intention to act. And in the middle of those two extremes is an emotional engagement to the issue and then a, a, a better awareness and understanding of root causes. And it's the cycle of emotional awareness and a better exposure to root causes that cycles together that builds the energy, I would say, to move people off, off of status quo in their daily lives, where they might be aware of a concept or within the community of pain, but it might not kick them off enough of their daily routine so they're still passive. But if the emotional engagement and understanding of root causes is extreme enough or severe enough, uh, balanced enough against their everyday living, they'll intend to act. And so our, our scale that we developed that's, that just got out a, a month ago is an attempt to kind of measure the individual level. So that, again, I'm going to circle back to what I started talking about, which is who's your audience and what level of critical consciousness are we trying to move somebody through? In my mind, we're trying to move people also off of their passive adaptation of daily living to do something about an issue. And photo voice can do that, but we have to be very intentional about its use as a method to figure out, is, is it the media we're moving? And if so, what's their emotional engagement? And do they understand the root causes? And can they do something? Is it a city council person? What's their emotional engagement to the issue? Do they understand the root causes? Do they have the capacity to do something about it? And can we move them to... Um, intentions to act. I think too often we get hung up in the world of saying, oh, let's just take photos and put captions and put it out there and something will happen. It may, but if you're intentional and you really think about what you're trying to accomplish with some planning, you can really leverage the method in ways that I don't think we've even begun to tap into. Is that too much, Robin? I love that. No, I, I mean, I think it's, I, I mean, I mean I've, uh, I, I've been thinking of the you know, these are the sort of many tentacles of photo voice, right? You know, and, and it's great to have Marianne here to, to recognize that there's two, you know, to work in two different countries as intensely as you've done, right? Inside with the Ford Foundation and then sticking in Nairobi, like you said, for, for the longer term, like the people who return are the people that, you know, that care about the community the most. And working with Julius and Boniface and, and the other people who've been part of your crew, uh, post shoot back to really kind of try and uh, try and try and noodle through some of the political change that needs to happen inside Kenya uh, for 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 advancing uh, for advancing quality of life for people right uh, simple as that mm -hmm. it's 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 challenging in different environments and I'm struck by John's you know global kind of approach to men's health and really seeing how photo voice is sort of untangling some some areas of empowerment for men that that are, that are they're not necessarily sort of contained within a sort of academic space in terms of what it means to be critically aware, I, I guess, I don't know. Um, but just just Marianne, just briefly, this, this shoot back and this work that uh, the folks did to kind of come back and produce art, where, where did that, what, what, what has ended up leading towards your, your interest in the trust for indigenous culture and health? And how did that, is that, is that, is that seeking the change that Bob is talking about? It is, I mean, Bob is, you're very clear and intentional. Um, and I'm a sort of ceremonialist of the spirit, but uh, you know, I think we're on the same, um, well, I know we're on the same team, but I, 
you know, the way you language it. I just want to tell a quick story because I think, you know, which is about the body mapping. We've been doing, because painting um, and art and puppetry can sometimes diffuse. You know, you talk about, um, I, I heard someone today talk about therapeutic photography and, you know, we've talked about art therapy. But sometimes you can represent a really painful situation in a painting in a way that you can in a photograph. So I was asked very briefly by the international coalitions of sites of conscience to do a body mapping workshop with torture survivors from Nyayo House in Kenya. Now, those of you who know Kenya, during the Moy regime, the actual administrative building, the basement was a was cells and people were tortured on the top floor of this building. And so I gathered a group of, um, well, the, the, the group was gathered. They they put forward a group of people to do a body mapping workshop um, to sort of document what had happened to them and their healing journey. Because with body mapping, it's about the healing journey. So it's where you came from, where you want to be, and how you're getting there. And at the and it was one of the most extraordinary. It took it felt like it took ten years off my life and gained ten years of my life because I learned so much. And the, the person who worked, did it with me, I, when they asked me to do it, I said, you know, I can run a workshop with rape survivors because I know that. But I'm not, I haven't been tortured, so I need to find someone to work with. And I found a woman from South Africa who was a torture survivor who did do art therapy. And we got together and we were kind of comparing because I do a, I set up a, um, an altar and she's very, you know, non, no, you know no smudges and, you know, I have Native American blood, so I, I do these things. And, and, and so she said, well, so you can do whatever you want so long as you don't use the F word. And I thought, F word? I don't typically say that when I'm teaching. I said, what do you mean? She said, forgiveness. You know, don't use that F word. I said, well, I wouldn't, wouldn't dream of, you know, I get that. So we went on, we did this incredible body mapping, and then we were able to get into the basement of Miyayo House to do a ceremony with the body mapping people. And it's a long story, but, and, and so the AP police were there. They thought they were gonna be arresting all of us. We get in, we do a silent ceremony with candles and we go cell to cell and people are, are just sort of saying, this is, this is where that happened to me. And at the end, when we, at the very end of, you know, it was bringing light into darkness. So we showed each other where we had been. We gathered around, I, I, brought in a box and a kanga and I had candles. We all had a taper candle. And we had a big candle to light and it could be silent or it could be spoken. And some were silent and some were, some thanked their family, some, and one person actually asked, asked that there would be some uh, help given to the people who were torturing them because they knew they were also suffering. And at the end, one of the police came up and asked if he could have a candle mm. and lit a candle on the altar. And I'm thinking, is that, you know, um, Robert, that's a kind of consciousness changing. Now, what he did when he went back to the station with that story, I'll never know. But mm. things started to shift in the stories about torture. People were pretending they didn't know it had happened there. This small group of body mappers are not responsible for that, but it was one iterative piece of people listening to each other and their, the insights that they gained from having a safe space to talk about it and to share the images that came from that. It was extraordinary. Very, very powerful, very powerful words. Thank you, Marianne. It sort of, it does, it does bring us sort of back to this idea that, um, Photo voice, all of the people in this panel are using photo voice and using other uh, methods and uh, like body mapping and other things to kind of try and elicit and get, get a little closer to that. We, we're, we become um, uh, practitioners of many sorts of methods. Photo voice is one of those sorts of things that has been central to us, um, but, but, there's, but there's other ways of engaging with that. I, I, I keep thinking that when Dr. Brinton likes in reading her work and I know she's speaking later, but uh, this uh, certainly using using drawings, using other kinds of mo modalities would be really it was is really interesting. Um, in terms of that, uh, looking at folks because we're 
we're almost at we're two thirds of the way through this panel. I wonder. I asked. I asked our panelists to kind of bring some photographs or some photographs and photo texts of um, uh, think a, a photo that's, that's that's that speaks to them uh, from the generation of photo voice. I have no idea what people have brought. So uh, if if you've brought a photo. Um, uh, and you're willing to share it, why don't we sort of go around the room and see what our panelists have produced? I'm going to look at Jen Frickers first because she's the newest to the photo voice scene. So I'm desperately interested to see what someone who comes in, starts writing about, starts doing photo voice research, what are they going to produce? So, so Jen, what, what, do, what, what do you do that for us? Starts carrying on about anti-coloniality. Um, I also, you generated I, something in the chat for that. That was very good. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, and I also wanted to, um, I'm going to steal a moment to speak to something or add respectively to something that, that Bob said, which is, I think we need to talk about critical, um, adjusting our own critical consciousness, right? Like, and I have found of late, like with my latest project in BIPOC nursing students and how they've dealt with the stressors of pandemic, racial justice protests and continuing their formation as nursing professionals that, um, there's a lot of readiness to act. And among indigenous peoples that I worked with in Ecuador, there's a lot of readiness to act. Um, I, I don't find people to be, you know, sort of um, passive or lacking power, but rather we need to bring sort of the resources, right? And that um, power translation or, or disruption um, into that as an active possibility, perhaps. And a lot of that has to do with sort of decolonizing ourselves, right? And our own notions of um, what we're representing in this sort of triangle of, I feel like it's like community and history and the institution that we have to represent. And so um, in any event, that was a thought that came up when you were talking, Bob. Um, so let me see if I can share the, the correct screen and show you the image. Can y'all see? Yes, yes, we can. Hopefully, okay. This is a this is a photo from um, from Ecuador um, from Isabel who lived in um, the northern Andes in a parish called Tupigachi. And um, of course, I, some of the stuff that I've discussed is about cross language research and the challenges of cross language research. And so I'll read to you first the caption and the title and caption in Spanish, and then I can um, give you the, the translation. Um, but this is uh, called Clasificación de Nuestro Producto, so classification of our product. Es para sacar una buena semilla para la siembra del próximo año y para nuestro alimento. So it's to separate the good seed for next year's sowing and for our food. So here the discussion was, um, one of the questions was around this notion of uh, sumac causai, which is Quechua for buen vivir, which is Spanish for sort of good living or well-being. Um, and this was one of the many, many photos taken of corn. <laughs> um, and Isabel notes that, you know, almost all families grow corn plots of some kind size. And this activity is a regular task. And I don't know about you, but all of this corn looks relatively alike <laughs> to me. And so um, one of the things that we were talking about or that I think is an interesting area that excites me is this notion of embodiment. And this was one of those photos that came out of um, that, that helped to show one of the um, one of the findings of the study, which was there is this sort of embodied knowledge that comes from living, um, having your own health intertwined with the health of the land and the environment and the animals and the plants and so forth. And so here I thought this one was a really good um, illustration of that um, and that that embodied knowledge of Isabel and her mother. Um, thanks. It's that's lovely. Um, I, 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 what was I, I did have a follow up question with that with that work that you were doing because you're you're doing it this in both Spanish and in English, and you mm -hmm. you made a conscious decision to stay in the Spanish for your analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Instead yeah. of going back into the English and taking all the translations back, is that right? Yes. So I kept. I mean, the whole the whole. Um, study was done in Spanish exclusively. And then 
Um, and then it was a bit difficult, right? Like to come back and I did make that conscious decision that I would, it, all the, it, the data was analyzed in Spanish. Anybody who has, you know, dual language or multiple language fluency realizes I started to translate, you know, the titles and captions to English at the beginning. And I was like, this is terrible. Like this is not, it does not convey the same meaning. And so, um, so I kept it in Spanish until the very end, until I had to produce the manuscript for my dissertation. And then all of the, um, all of the titles and captions and quotes are actually presented in Spanish and in, with the English translations underneath them. And of course, there's all kinds of um, stickiness um, and positionality and, and pitfalls that come from doing the work that way, which I'd be happy to discuss, but yeah. I love it that you had to sort of like, then then make it fit into the square peg that was the square hole that, that was the academic institution for your dissertation. Right, and nobody on my committee spoke <laughs> Spanish. And so uh, that was right. another, you know, they were like, you kind of have to trust me here. Um, but yes, it worked out. <laughs> Michelle, how about you? Do you have a photo to share with us? Yeah, uh, this was not easy. Uh, I could not pick one, uh, but I do have one. Um, so kind of staying with my theme, um, you know, as I sort of mentioned, I think a lot of my work right now has kind of come back to the local and exploring a lot of difficult issues where I am. And, um, you know, just, um, yeah, exploring a lot of difficult issues where I am. Um, you know, I'm in a sort of tense environment. There's, there's kind of very opposing opinions about a lot of different things. And, you know, I've just been trying to think about, like I said, photo voice as a way to express some of those issues and tensions or even create almost like a third space where people can have a space where they can, you know, so it doesn't have to be that they come together, but there's this third space where they kind of can explore these issues. Um, so anyway, um, you know, another part of this, this story is, um, you know, I have had to, I've been here 12 years, I've had to fight a lot of these years for the value of my work. So um, I don't want to be negative Nelly to the students in the room and such, but it's, it's been hard. Um, you know, I was told many times early on not to study HIV, that it wasn't a problem, which isn't true. And it's very much a problem in the Midwest. And, and I was told I wouldn't be successful, you know, doing a career around a certain method. So um, none of that's true. And I, um, you know, so I would encourage everyone to come <laughs> to that. Uh, <laughs> but I'm realistic. I mean, I'm, I'm laughing with you in pain and suffering as well, but also celebrate yeah. the fact that you have yeah, I mean, I, something. I want to put it, yeah, I, you can forge ahead, but I want to put it out there. Um, so um, that, that there is, there is, there is haters and you just got to, you just got to keep pushing through. Um, but so, um, this is an older picture I'm going to share. So early on, um, I decided to do a, a photo voice project really in the middle of Missouri around what living with HIV meant to men in Missouri. And again, I, I didn't know what to expect. And the naysayers had gotten into my head a little bit. Um, but the pictures were ridiculously powerful. All right, let's see. I got to... Um, and they really highlighted, so can you guys see this one now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can see so they, really, yeah. they really highlighted um, the idea of stigma. So this is one that, you know, people kind of, you could see up till the very last moment, I couldn't decide between the two. But anyway, this, this uh, person here is talking about um, the trouble with talking to his parents about his sexual identity and uh, that therefore stopped him from obviously getting support for um, HIV. Um, and yeah, I, do, I think it's a really uh, powerful image. Um, but again, I, I think part of it too was the, the whole exhibit was very powerful like this and it just kind of reiterated to me that um, there was a lot going on with HIV in Missouri, even central Missouri, and that, um, you know, Photo Voice was able to tap into that in a, in a kind of different and powerful way so that, you know, as someone was saying early on, I, I think it was Marianne, like, you know, people couldn't ignore it, right? Because there was just these powerful images of stigma after stigma after stigma. Um, so I picked that picture for today. Yeah, just kind of to remind myself um, to sort of stay in it uh, where I am when I'm in, again, the sort of very constrained political space that I'm in. So. I, 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 I love this image too, because it, it, it's, um, 
it, it's speaking right back to the viewer, right? Yeah. Um, it's and it has that um, it it that that for for me sometimes photo voice is about opening up a conversation into that third space that you're talking about, Michelle, right? right. So this right. this is this is the subterranean vault of right. of of our work, right? Um, that that uh, despite the levels of oppression that we are trying to um, bring people out, this this has a personal link for us. That kind of obviously you've thought about this image. You probably if you, if someone goes think of an image, you're thinking of this sometimes, right? In, inside this work, because this was like a discovery, a connection to actually you, Michelle Tetis, uh, Tet Tetty, like the you know uh, the researcher at Missouri who's doing this weird thing, photo voice. But you're right. suddenly like, you're suddenly engaged personally with this. I just love that. And any comments on this image from others? Hearing none, we'll move on to John, because John was going to share with us an image. He's looking, he's frowning now. So maybe, maybe you have it. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So the backstory is is oh. simple. I think it's a it's a very, very simple photograph. And it's about a very, very complicated grief. So this is a a mum who lost her boy to suicide. And the rawness of this strikes me every time I look at it. Um, the pallor. Um, the house at the back, um, and it was just such a powerful image to talk about something we don't talk about. So when we had we had an exhibition in a professional space, four hundred people showed up, and we had all these kind of photos that were uh, related to bereavement around suicide, but also related to guys who are experiencing suicidality, and the conversations that went on in and around those photographs that that night were just so destigmatizing. Like everyone had a relationship to the topic. And oftentimes people talked about it for the first time. So it was great at debunking it. And to my earlier comment on the panel, just this is the relational nature of men's health. <laughs> you know, like, so it, it just puts it in perspective around everyone's affected, you know. Um, by dire outcomes and, and everyone should be lobbied to get upstream to make a difference. So it's really nice in that way. And, I, and just one final thing just to say, ethics-wise, it raised an issue for us as well. This one got right-clicked by a filmmaker who wanted to raise money to tell a story about mental health challenges, but thought this was, this was open. So it took a, took a picture at the gallery of this photo and then used it to raise money. And she didn't believe she was transgressing any copyrights. And we talked to her and talked to her th through it. But again, it's just that, that notion of who owns the photographs or who has the, the right to reproduce them. So it was, it was such a complex photograph and I still use it. It's very powerful. It also marks one of the first times we got through UBC Ethics to include people who wanted to be included. So they signed a waiver so you can identify her. We check in with her about using this image all the time because your grief can change over time. Um, and so just very powerful in an ongoing way. Yeah. So many things you just said there are triggering me, right? Uh, ongoing over time, like images images change and, and influence us over time. And this, and this really, you know, thorny issue around ethics uh, that kind of uh, comes inside this. Um, and, um, and it it's probably, is it reaches us, right? Somehow that image reaches us in a way yeah. that's more profound than, than, than most other type of research. Yeah. Right, it's, 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 it draws, I think it draws us into an analysis every time we look at it. Like for mm -hmm. me, I'm still seeing layers in that. Mm -hmm. And so, and when I go back to the narrative, because she's not the participant, but when I go back to the participant's narrative about the grief, the complicated grief of the mother, then it just takes you into another space. And anyhow, I, the layers of it, yeah, we never quite, never quite make the full use of the photographs. We've grappled with that for a long time. You know, I don't think semiotics is necessarily the answer, but, I, but, but we use a kind, of a, 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 a kind of a scrapbook effect where we'll go, oh, here's a picture to illustrate a theme. And I'm like, something like that 
in and of itself, there's a paper in that, right? Like there's a full story to be told and we take snippets and we're trying to do a better job of that. But, uh, you know, it's because um, it's just so weird, Joe. And I think, I think probably in critical qualitative work where we're, where we're seeing something uh, like an image, right? And we're, we're dealing with visuals, uh, but we are also kind of like uh, having to deal with our own emotional reaction to something and manage that. Um, yeah, when you talk about layers, that, that, that really erupts. Any other comments? I'm gonna to switch to Bob because Bob's got something to share as well. So bring it well, on. I actually, I actually had a different photo and I, and I decided to switch because Jenny made a comment. I thought it's worth <laughs> uh, going <laughs> deeper, but you know, it's great. It's like the, the you, you said something that I think needs to be amplified because so much of what we give to this method, we get so much back out of it. And the, 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 the degree to which, you know, I think, you know, we are the audience, the, professionals that are really, I would argue probably for you as well, like you're on the front lines of caring about society. And so you're doing these methods because you want to see change occur. And so some of it is just our own consciousness raising about what we see and don't see, right? So I think Jen's comment is, is spot on. And I think for a lot of us, the critical consciousness is something that has existed and we're tapping into for the first time, right? So, I mean, originally I had a photo and I'm a just tell that story before I show the photo, but it's in Kenya. I had a chance to do a prep project in Saye, Kenya, where the you know, HIV rate is very high. Um, and women were taking pictures of prep uh, pills that they were hiding in trees and in holes outside of their houses because of the stigma of the use of prep being associated with sex workers. Um, one of the things that people have been trying to do is to have the pharmaceutical companies change the color of the pills. And so that even just, just simple having a different colored pill allows for a differentiation. And even though women are taking PrEP in, in these parts of the world, or in, in this case, Kenya, because their husbands are going off and working and coming back after many weeks of being unfaithful um, or having multiple sex partners, but yet the women are being held to a standard of being seen as sex workers because they're taking PrEP. So the women are hiding the PrEP. You know, the photo voice project we did highlighted that it's nothing new to the women of Kenya, right? Um, it might be new to some of the men of Kenya that women are hiding it, but it's certainly not new to the women. And how do we get that out to other people? The image I'm gonna share though, is kind of related to who we're trying to influence. And this is from just one of the many projects over many years. It's, it's a simple picture of a person holding a cigarette in a work setting. And you can read the caption from Thomas, age 14, saying people should not be allowed to smoke in their workplace. You know, in of itself, it's a benign, or not a benign, it's a very, you know, a very specific recognition that, you know, smoking should not be allowed. The interesting thing about this story is always the, the backstory behind the photo, right, and the caption. In this particular case, Thomas's mother um, saw the photo that her child took and took this to her boss. And this is a manufacturing facility in North Carolina. Um, and the boss had a relative die recently of tobacco. And because of the confluence of those events, that person's critical consciousness was raised, right? And so Thomas's consciousness has been there. Thomas's mother's consciousness has been there. But the audience in this case is this owner of this mill that ran this factory that then banned smoking on the job. A simple, small photo and the right timing was enough to raise the critical consciousness of a decision maker. And so to me, I never think of participants of a photovice project as participants. I think of them as co-researchers, co-advocates, and that the target of my intervention is always the people that they're trying to influence. And this is a nice example of whenever I talk about critical consciousness, I'm hardly ever thinking about what I'll call the impacted population. I'm thinking about the people we're trying to influence. I love this. It's, it, it brings me back to thinking about the multiple relations that you work with when you work with uh, co-researchers, as, as, as you call them. Um, they have relationships. Um, the the uh, person who took uh, John's photo of their mother, right, is, is also, there's, there are, there are relationships within, within that and our, our ability to kind of balance that through, through our work to build relationships with co-researchers and also um, address 
uh, address address their political concerns and needs um, is really important. I'll, I'll, hey, Robin, uh, before you bridge to the next thing, I just want to point out to everybody who's listening, if you're not following the chat, people are putting in comments, thoughts, articles, yeah. definitely chase these things because you're we're listening to each other and we learn from each other. And if the more you want to pursue and chase these threads afterwards, I highly encourage it. I don't want you to miss the opportunity to benefit from what moves each person that's talking. Yeah, very nice. Very nice stuff. Very alive chat. I think um, the conference organizers should be complimented on how jazzed up they've gotten the audience going on this. Um, I'll share mine because it kind of brings us a little bit back to Caroline Wang uh, and others. But this, this is... Uh, when I'm when I'm when I'm thinking about photo voice and I'm trying to explain this, I always get a chuckle out of this photograph that came out of um, uh, the 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 Caroline Wangs and um, uh, and and her group at uh, Michigan who put on the Flint photo did the Flint photo voice paper. Um, it, it's 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 lovely and explained in the paper how you know this is the bridge that everybody burned the copy of Time magazine or something that said that Flint was the worst place to live, um, but for me this has sort of like the salience of this is someone holding the camera in the old days right sort of looking back at this the time that photo voice has been around and we've changed. Uh, the devices we're using, and like John was saying, we're, we're now using, you know, people are taking photo images from things that they're snapping online and then sending that in and, and wanting to have a voice and wanting to kind of figure out wh where, uh, how, how the environment is expressed in terms of people. Um, uh, Cynthia is uh, the, the, the wife of her husband who took this photograph, right? Um, uh, there are so many other links towards Flint, Michigan and the struggles that Flint, Michigan went through since that since this photo was taken right um, uh, from uh, all the way to you know the Black Lives Matter work um, and and certainly through the Flint water crisis that happened uh, uh, five or six uh, or seven years ago so really really sort of important to me in terms of thinking around Flint Michigan whenever I hear Flint Michigan in the news I'm brought back to this photograph and I'm brought back to ordinary people doing extraordinary things through photo voice work and so I, I just and and I love the title I just love the title some people don't do titles in photo voice some people are just to do the text I like the title because that becomes kind of this other interpretive moment but to say looking back at you while you're looking back at me is magic to me uh, it stays in my head and it's part of uh, sort of my consciousness around how I think about uh, and, and talk about uh, photo voice Hey, put that photo back up just for a split second, because I'm going to introduce another concept. <laughs> I'm not sure if this photo is from that particular effort, but one of the things that um, Carolyn did when she was in Flint was she had a photo voice, and I'd like to see more of this in the field. That's why I'm going to bring it up. She had an effort where she had the people in the, in the community take photos, but then she also had the parents, the teachers, the police, the uh, city council person. So she thought about uh, a photo voice project where different layers of the ecology were representing the issue. And then you can compare the different layers of a community's view on a topic, right? Um, that's, this image is a nice segue to that brain, that brain thought around, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me. Now you have a police a city council person reflecting and you get to see the intersections of people's point of view on a particular set of issues and see where the connects are and largely probably where the disconnects are. So um, again, it kind of gets back to like, who are we trying to influence and, and how do we connect both on truth and heart around issues that we care about? Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I, um, obviously I got the book. Um, uh, so that was another that was another kind of uh, keeping the keeping the photo voice memorabilia going in my in my in my bookshelf. Um, uh, other comments from folks before we sort of go to this last round of maybe we we'll, we can start with sort of what's inspiring you now with photo voice and where are you hoping to go and uh, in your own personal interests and your activism. Mary Ann. You're you're sort of on the you're 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 looking you're looking at all of this work that's gone on with photo voice. So you are you you be, did you track it much over time? Did you no. see it? You I'm embarrassed to say. No, I'm blown away. 
Um, and, and everything, you know, Michelle's third space and Jen talking about language and embodiment, you know, the All China Women's Federation didn't want us to put China, the book in Chinese because it's, that's where the power is, right? And, and they didn't the want this in Chinese because it's bilingual. It's all the way through, it's bilingual. Uh, yes, because I wasn't, that, that was the deal. <laughs> I mean, it was all in Chinese and then they wanted it to only be in English because then it's less threatening, right? I mean, like who cares? And, um, and, you know, and what John said about the conversations after the exhibition and what Robert says about the layers and the backstories and Mieko earlier said something about how do we take pictures of the invisible? And that's what we're doing. You know, power is, it's visible, but it's invisible. And when I look back at the shoot back book, you know, I mean, I, I went, my naivete is you know, quite, you know, I thought those photographs were, so, and we were very insistent. Those, the pages of shoot back are the pages of the photographer's journals. It's their writing, it's their words. They love it. No one wanted that book. We couldn't give them away. You give them to people who don't know what those communities look like, and they—it was a horror story. I was trying—I was giving it to my friends to give to their kids, and it was like, Woo! and to me, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful story of real life, and so I mean, I keep thinking about Robert's consciousness. Um, it, you know, maybe we should rock that one out again. And I'm really challenged by, we make a calendar every year at Tika, which is very um, purposely uh, incendiary. And this next year has a whole page about co colonialism, decoloniz decolonization. And it, I'm trying, I'm, my brain is just going. I don't quite know what will come from this, but something will. That won't be about me. <laughs> it isn't about me. But um these images are so rich and beautiful that, uh, and, and the other thing is we're doing lots of public mural art, lots and lots of it. And again, the process is the point, the means are the ends. The way the young artists are getting together, we've had so many suicides in the young artist community under COVID because nobody's making any money and people are starving. And, and the way they've come together around paint, deciding what is beautiful, because it's not message boards, it's, you know, how to make this space in our village more beautiful. Um, it's really, it always lights my fire. And as has this conversation, it's very humbling to see all the ways that, you know, that you, the rigor of it, but the open heartedness of it, because it's the unexpected things mm -hmm. that are the magic. You know, um, that's so wonderful, Marianne. And, and, and it's, obvious to me that when you and Caroline and, and Virginia kind of embarked on this and I, I Caroline related to us that, that there was like a, a conversation at a like a table in a room in Stanford where someone said hey why don't we and it was it was Caroline's mother who said why don't you get people to take cameras in so um, I would have loved to have been a, a fly on the wall watching that kind of conversation but just this notion of beauty as well and 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 um it, her editorial talked about, you know, the heart and 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 really really leading with the heart in, inside this work, and we see it inside these images in this work. What's inspiring, folks? What's inspiring you, Bob, for for the future now? Well, for me, I, I know one of the things we talked about leading into this was sort of what's the moment within society, and I think about, I think we are at an, an inflection point. You know, there's a, I I can't tell you how many times I hear, you know. Uh, capitalist incursion type language about an examination of what's wrong with society and coming through COVID, we've demonstrated that there are some imbalances that are just coming home to roost and to reckon with and to grapple with. So I do think we're at a pivot point, um, whether it's foot of voice or some other effort to try to change the conversation, shift our consciousness. Um, recognize the connectedness between not only people within one society, but across the globe. I mean, I think in my mind, you're asking me what I'm thinking of. I think there is this moment, this opportunity. Um, I don't know how we'll come out the other side necessarily, but I think methods like photo voice, I and mean, we, we named the special issue, which I know you put a link in early and we'll put it in again. I encourage you to go 
chase the special issue. We've got some great articles in there, some resources. Just use it because it's um, it was a labor of love of Robin and I, but I also think it has a lot to offer. But I think I don't know how we'll come out the other side of it, but I think photo voice can be part of this and as demoralizing sometimes as the moment can be without a sense of purpose, it's hard to go day to day. And so I see photo voice as that sense of purpose, you know, and I think I see our role, you know, I say our broadly people that have maybe the ability to connect resources, to connect networks, to elevate voice, to um, demonstrate power. It, I think that's the purpose that we bring to this moment. And the much as much as we can amplify that and magnify it within the community, the better off we'll be. So I'm both uh, challenged but heartened by what we can do. Challenged but heartened. Michelle, let's go with you next because you're in the challenging state right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of similarities. I'm definitely um, motivated by the opportunities for perhaps like collective efficacy. Again, as, as Bob said, in this sort of post um, you know post COVID world, I'm I'm motivated by like the differences in the way people see things. And again, creating those spaces where they can come together. Um, you know, briefly, there was a foundation in Missouri and, and they do a lot of health equity work and they put out this call and they basically said, you know, we do all this health equity work, but a lot of our kind of rural partners, they don't like that word. It doesn't mean the same thing to them. We're not connecting with them. So I had written this proposal in response to their announcement kind of like a giant photo voice project I was going to do across the state in terms of how different constituents understood health equity. And um, I was really excited about it. And they, they emailed me and they said they were, they were interested in talking to me and we had a meeting and, and it was, I was very excited. But when, when I had the meeting, they, <laughs> they were like, yeah, um, yeah, we, we like your, like the things you're writing about, but like photo voice isn't the right method for this. It's too like, we're not there yet. It's too kind of aggressive, right? So they were like, we thought you could, you know, get people together in a room and just say the words health equity, <laughs> like see what they would say back. <laughs> and I was like, okay, no. <laughs> but I still think this project would be really kind of interesting. Again, like maybe people wouldn't come together, but I'm motivated by creating those kind of third spaces in these tense moments. And where can we find the collective, you know, collective piece. Um, yeah, and then just, a, you know, another note of what's motivating me, um, hard questions around, again, institutions like universities. Um, I've been looking at issues of institutional trauma and, um, you know, racial trauma and how they've kind of built the spaces we're in and how to kind of help people come out of a place of denial and make sense of that to kind of grow into the future. So I'm motivated. Um, by those kind of topics too that I've been working on because I do have a core group of people who are ready to go and I'm motivated by the revolution from within and I do have people who are ready to go on it. They're just not the people in charge, but I'm still motivated by their energy. So. It's a, well, it's an ongoing struggle. Thank you yes. so much, Michelle. And one last thing, Marianne's yes. um, note about kind of the means are the ends is just uh, really, really important. So I just wanted to yeah. say it again. The means are the ends is such an important uh, thing. To I wrote consider. that down. <laughs> yeah. John, how about you? What's inspiring you? Um, I, you all are inspiring me, and um, it's just been great to be on the panel. Just yeah, just a, a quick couple of things just to resonate around um, uh, the coming around health equity. So we're doing health equity in intimate partner relationships, and we're talking to guys. They talk to us about equality. They don't talk to us about equity. And it's just interesting. I'm one, I, I, in the analysis, it's going to be so interesting because I, I'm not sure we've got the right word. I think we've got the right meaning <laughs> that we want it, what we're trying to look at, but I'm not sure it's accessible to a lot of young men that we're talking to. Just to, just to shout that out. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that notion of language and how we use it and how we operationalize. Anyway, just a shout out. I think at the moment we're just craving authenticity. The method is alive and well because we're craving authenticity. You can see in these pictures and these narratives, like it's real, right? Like it, it counts. It just counts. And it's and you can access it. And so I think we're craving it more than ever. I, I don't remember another period in history when we've just 
been a little bit flatter as a society over worldwide just for the stuff that's happened. So I think it's I think it's really really good that way. We're trying to move the photo voice pictures from these guys. We're trying to move it into them voting for the photographs that they most want to exhibit online. And then we're trying to take that poll and do the exhibit. And then we're trying to get the, the guys who are interested to take their photographs and develop a digital storytelling piece mm -hmm. to bring them to life in a sequenced way with their own narration. A bit ambitious, um, but it's been so much fun and it's all been virtual just because of the COVID thing, but we've learned so much. So, so I'm trying to think about how we adapt the method how we continue to, you know, work with it and all its beauty and all that you put forward, Marianne, and continue to do, eh? So just, yeah. So Thank you, John. That's, that's lovely. Yeah. Um, this, there's, there's more to be seen. We'll keep, we'll keep, we'll keep watching for your, for your next publication out of that. Jen, uh, how about you? What's inspiring you? Um, yeah, given my, that my area and work concerns community-based well-being. Right now, I'm really inspired and becoming increasingly involved in like One Health and Eco Health movements. Also, I think that all of the Futurities movements are really inspiring. There's Nursing Futurities, there's Black Futurities, and there's many more, um, as well as Integral Ecology. And I think sort of as a disabled person, that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about embodied healing and. I think that needs to sort of come into connection with this one health and integral ecology area um, in the chat Melanie is talking about you know the interdisciplinary like the extending the reach you know um, and crossing disciplines integrating them not just you know being in our silos embodiment like I mentioned was one of the key findings from my photo voice co researchers in Ecuador when we talked about Indian notions of well being, you know that well being stems from this your enacted life, which is constantly seeing human bodies and health intertwined with environmental health and the, the health of all life on the planet. Um, and I think embodiment is somewhat an abstract concept, but really, really important. And to my knowledge, health professionals um, spend like no time learning about embodiment and considering how it contributes to the health of well-beings or communities. If anything, health education focuses on disembodying people in a way of learning about conditions and solutions. So um, I think that this idea of hyper-local like interaction between human bodies and the environment, um, there's a lot to be learned and gained in terms of effective um, human and environmental health praxis from studying that site. So uh, that's one of the things that's exciting me now. Well, folks, you heard it here first. Th these are these are four crack researchers, a veteran researcher and community mover and shaker from 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 Kenya, from uh, from all around the world. I'm just uh, we, we, photo voice is just getting started. Um, got uh, 2000 plus published articles out there. You are on the cusp, right? You are on the beginning of a social change movement uh, motivated through visual methods and visual means. Um, Marianne, thanks so much for talking to us about body maps too. That's given me some new ideas moving forward. Uh, beautiful stories about being in the prison and talking about that uh, that work there. John, uh, your, your work with, uh, with men across the world is, is inspiring me. And, and Michelle, uh, your struggles inside an institution, but also kind of seeing the light at the end of that, it's just really, really lovely. And, and Bob, uh, you've been a great, a great friend and a conspirator, but also, also somebody who's kept, <laughs> kept me going. Um, Bob, was the, Bob inspired these questions today, right? So he's the main, he's the main culprit um, if the questions worked or they didn't for, the, for everybody. And Jen, uh, it's just wonderful to get to know you better and to get to know you as one of these new upcoming uh, photo voice researchers is really like working inside that anti-colonial space and really thinking differently about the way we can get our message out there. Thank you. Robin, every, you know, great I'm comment. thinking, Robin, I'm thinking that uh, t-shirt, the little method that can change the world, photo voice, I think we need to get those out there, there for go. everybody. That's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we're going to say goodbye, but it's not uh, until we see each other again. Bye-bye.